Podemos empezar la grabación. Muchas gracias. Es un gusto saludar a todos ustedes, todos los colegas de la organización, los directores, representantes de los centros colaboradores de nuestra región, investigadores, personal de comunidad científica. Hemos hecho todo un esfuerzo para asegurar que este webinario sea ampliamente conocido y que podamos tener lo máximo de, de, de personas participando de este momento tan especial que es el lanzamiento de este número especial relacionado al trabajo, a la cooperación técnica, a colaboración de los centros colaboradores de la OMS en la región de las Américas que se publican en otro eh, instrumento tan importante que es la revista Panamericana de Salud Pública. Antes de dar continuidad y empezar nuestro evento con una muy breve introducción, me gustaría simplemente de acordar a todos los participantes que tenemos interpretación simultánea al inglés, al español y al portugués y simplemente pueden buscar ahí en el, en el panel de control el símbolo que es un globo donde pueden elegir los idiomas que quieren escuchar y seguir a nuestro webinar. Luego, para un tema también de asegurar más calidad en la transmisión, yo pido muy amablemente a los panelistas y moderadores de la sesión que por favor pongan sus micrófonos mudo justamente para asegurar que no tengamos ruido y ningún problema de aprovechar las intervenciones de los moderadores y de los panelistas. Por un tema también de logística, los micrófonos y cámaras de los participantes van a estar desactivados y uh, vamos a eh, eh, asegurar que ustedes puedan hacer alguna interacción con los, con los panelistas y, y, y moderadores a través del Q&A. Entonces, tenemos una sesión también con un icono ahí en el Zoom que se llama Q&A, que pueden postar, postear sus preguntas, sus comentarios al, al, al largo de nuestro evento. No vamos a tener, por una cuestión de tiempo, espacio para abrir los micrófonos y hacer preguntas específicas a los autores o panelistas. Entonces, los moderadores, por favor, van a estar atentos para que las preguntas, los comentarios puestos en el Q&A puedan entonces ser respondidos en esta misma interfaz. Cualquier problema de audio que no se ve bien, que no se escucha bien, que hay un problema, ojalá no pase con, las inter, con la interpretación, pongan por favor en el chat, así todo el equipo de organización puede rápidamente identificar el problema y tratar de resolverlo, arreglarlo lo pronto posible. Entonces, dado este aspecto logístico de nuestro webinario, más una vez, sean muy bienvenidos. Esperamos que tengamos una experiencia muy provechosa de conocer más sobre este universo de los centros colaboradores y también de, uh, de, de, de la revista. Simplemente para dar contexto muy rápidamente, la Organización Panamericana de Salud, de, la Organización Panamericana de Salud es... Una, una organización que cubre la región de las Américas, es, la oficina, es también la oficina regional de la Organización Mundial de Salud para la región de las Américas, y ahí existe esta integración con los centros colaboradores. Tenemos 52 estados miembros, países y territorios, donde ayudamos a promover y a trabajar en el logro de mejor salud, mejor sistemas de, de salud, control de, de emergencias y desastres y avanzar para salud para todos. Entonces aquí están nuestros estados miembros, los estados asociados, países que participan de este entorno y países observadores. Entonces es un contexto 
bastante importante para ir aterrizando e ir llegando em la importância de este número especial que busca la convergência entre os centros colaboradores e a produção e o compartilhar informação e conhecimento. A la agenda de cooperação técnica da organização, que também va de encuentro e se alinha com o que fazer de los centros colaboradores, se concentram basicamente em estas seis linhas de trabalho de la organização junto a seus estados membros e com um elemento também de integração a nível mundial com a Organização Mundial de Saúde e também com outros aliados estratégicos. Então, estamos falando de um entorno que tem que ver com as uh, enfermidades transmissíveis, determinantes sociais, eh, eh, e, e environment e meio ambiente. Estamos falando de las enfermidades não transmissíveis, o entorno de saúde mental. Estamos falando de toda a saúde no curso de vida, saúde da de mulher, de, de los niños saúde reprodutiva, eh, então é todo o entorno de que segue o curso de vida de um, de um indivíduo. Sistemas e serviços de saúde, ter serviços mais resilientes, mais preparados, mais listos a responder com tantas necessidades de nossos Estados-membros e região, estar preparados para emergências e desastres em nossa região e assegurar que tenhamos uma cobertura, uma assistência de, de qualidade, tanto aos Estados-membros, tanto tam, também como ao entorno. E, mais importante, neste contexto de nosso webinário, é o entorno de informação e geração de conhecimento e informação. Neste módulo, aterrizamos também para um outro componente que é importante, é o entorno de la, de la organización en que va a buscar en sus, en sus principios que sea una organización basada en evidencia, basada en información y conocimiento, que sea una organización basada en la colaboración efectiva, que sea una organización basada y que busque enseñanza continua para que pueda buscar e innovar em si e também junto a los Estados membros e uma organização que está basada em alianças e em redes. Então, essas são palavras muito importantes para o entorno do trabalho que estamos fazendo juntos aqui neste momento. Compartilhar experiências, compartilhar inovação, documentar evidências através de redes, de la, de la, de la, de las alianças, através de los centros colaboradores e deste instrumento tão importante que é a revista. Aterrizando um pouco mais, os pilares de, de gestão do conhecimento, de compartilhar conhecimento, que é o trabalho de nossa de nuestra unidade, assegurar que tenhamos metodologias, ferramentas, plataformas que possam fortalecer a capacidade, prover mecanismos de compartilhar melhores práticas, lições aprendidas, generar conhecimento, generar evidência e uma, um ambiente multilingüe, ou seja, que os Estados-membros, que os investigadores encontrem as portas também para promover seu conhecimento em seu próprio idioma e com isso dividir, reduzir a brecha digital e fortalecer as redes e o panamericanismo. Os centros colaboradores em la região de las Américas suman no dia de hoje 178 centros colaboradores distribuídos em 16 países. Acuérdense del, del slide que hemos enseñado los 52. Entre estos 52, 16 países e territórios têm em seu eh, eh, alcance também hospedar e, e ter instituições que sirvem como centros colaboradores. É eh, válido acordar que os centros colaboradores para a região de las Américas são também reconhecidos como centros, organiza centros colaboradores de la OPS OMS por este hecho também de que a organização tem eh, eh, doble sombrero, por assim dizer. Estamos com a OEA, 
y también con la OMS. Entonces tenemos esta licencia de usar en el nombre el, 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 la palabra, el título de la organización. Por su vez, la revista congrega mucho del, del aspecto de redes y de descoverabilidad de información. La revista fue lanzada, fundada en el 1922, celebramos 100 años de la revista el año pasado. Es una revista trilingüe que permite la publicación de, de sus manuscritos en inglés, en español y en portugués. Es una revista revisada por pares, que se accede online, que sigue los estándares internacionales, principalmente del acceso abierto y no cobra para que autores publiquen y tampoco para que lectores accedan a su información. Entonces, la convergencia de estos dos universos fue lo que logró este eh, entorno tan importante. No quería dejar de hacer esta introducción sin antes reconocer el equipo de trabajo, Sandra Wang, que todos ustedes, seguramente los, los directores de centros conocen muy bien, a Damián y su equipo, y su equipo de la revista Panamericana y todo el equipo también del trabajo institucional que han logrado subir todos los manuscritos en nuestro repositorio. Entonces, literalmente, este proyecto fue un entorno que eh, tuvo la participación de todo el equipo de, de nuestro departamento, de nuestra equipe de unidad eh, técnica de gestión del conocimiento. Con esto, termino esta breve inter, eh, introducción y eh, le eh, solicito, entonces, paso la palabra a nuestro director de departamento, doctor Sebastián García Saizó, director de departamento de evidencia, inteligencia para acción y salud, donde se ubican justamente la unidad de gestión del conocimiento, los centros colaboradores y la revista Panamericana. Doctor, muchísimas gracias por estar aquí con nosotros y le paso la palabra para la apertura oficial de nuestro webinario. Thank you, thank you, Eliani. Please allow me to switch to to English. Um, I must I must start by complaining that Eliani didn't have a timer on, and now I have a timer on. I, I don't think that's uh, uh, equitable. But I, anyhow, um, I don't want to repeat, Eliani gave a very broad and complete perspective of why we're here and why this is so relevant for the work that we carry out in the organization and, and, and something that of course is not done alone. So it's not just the organization working uh, to, to fulfill these needs and these goals set by, by the member states. It's a work that we do with all of you. We do with collaborating centers. We do with all of the institutions that work together with PAHO and WHO to uh, advance in this agenda. And of course, to um, acknowledge and try to respond to many of the health needs that uh, member states and of course, communities, families and individuals have in our region. I want to uh, welcome everyone on behalf of our director, Dr. Jarvas Barbosa, and I want to especially uh, welcome the heads and representatives from our collaborating centers, all of the moderators and panelists that make this uh, possible, and of course, the whole team from the Department of Evidence and Intelligence for Action in Health that make this uh, webinar and indeed all of the collaboration possible. As many of you recall, in, in April 2021, we all gathered together for our PAHO WHO Collaborating Centers Regional Webinar. This was named Engaging Our Partners to Achieve the SDGs Together. And that's precisely the spirit that we want to convey today. That it's a work that we all do together in which we all participate and where we need, of course, to bring and, and bring it in together and set up also the future work together. That webinar back in, in 2021 had the main goal of engaging and re-engaging collaborating centers as we discuss how we could all support the organization and the work carried out by PAHO in its effort to achieve the goals of the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. We were really glad to receive back at that, uh, that webinar several recommendations from the technical, strategical, and logistical perspectives. 
Two recommendations in particular led us to the production of this special issue of the Pan American Journal of Public Health that today we're launching with all of you, entitled to increase the visibility of collaborating centers work and to find innovative ways of providing technical cooperation. So during 2022, we, we took the task uh, uh, very, very um, uh, committed to set up what now is translated into this amazing special issue. Both as coordinators of the collaborating centers and of the Pan American Journal of Public Health, a call for abstracts was organized and we received 64 proposals of which through the whole editorial peer review and screening processes, we're able to select 60 of them um, for publishing and are now available in our institutional repository. These papers cover several areas and Eliani was giving some examples from this, from public health and also showcasing some of the work carried out by collaborating centers, both on, on the direct one-on-one -on -one, uh, collaboration and of course also through the various collaborating centers networks in existence that are key for maintaining and strengthening the role of collaborating centers and the impact of the work that we all together develop. And so we're very pleased launched today this special issue that celebrates the achievement of our common goals. And during this event, we will learn more about the production of this special issue, the special focus that the papers and have, and of course, the work that we all do together. And as Eliani was also saying in her presentation, besides being a milestone for the collaborating centers in our region, we are also particularly proud that this special issue is part also of the celebration of the 100th anniversary of the Pan American Journal of Public Health. The first volume of the journal published in May 1922, when it was still named the, uh, as the Boletín Panamericano de Sanidad or the Sanitary Pan American Bulletin, had in the three papers that were published in that first number, one that spoke precisely of the importance of the cooperation in health, entitled La Importancia de la Cooperación Sanitaria entre las Naciones, a paper that 100 years back describes exactly what we are trying to build and what we've accomplished as this very, very strong group of collaborating centers. Since then, it is a remarkable trajectory of continuous publication at the journal and this has allowed the journal to maintain its focus on the priorities in public health and also serving as a scientific vehicle for knowledge generation and, of course, sharing, promoting the use of evidence for decision making, combating the misinformation, and as an open space for the scientific community to make their discoveries available. I want to thank all of you for being here today with us, celebrating these two very important moments, uh, and, of course, for being part of this amazing group that we share uh, in terms of the work towards uh, uh, improving health and living conditions in the region of the Americas. So congratulations to you all, uh, welcome. And um, I hope we have a very successful webinar and a very interesting session to learn more on the work carrying out by collaborating centers. Thank you, Leani. I give the mic back to you and um, I look forward to hearing all of our panelists today. Thank you very much, Dr. Garcia, for such um, enthusiasm uh, words. Very, very, very important for us, those remarks. Without further ado, and for the sake of the time, Sandra Weinger, please go ahead uh, as you are gonna give us a very brief summary of the special issue. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, we're very happy to be here, very excited. This is a dream come true for all of us. Um, so yes, the region of the Americas has benefited from the support of Pahuhu Collaborating Center since 1950, when the first uh, center was designated in the United States at the School of Medicine, Johns Hopkins University. And since then, as Eliane mentioned, collaborating centers have supported Pahuhu in many technical areas. Uh, against the background that Dr. Garcia described, uh, once again, we, we 
together with the journal team, we decided to provide collaborating centers in the region an opportunity to make their work visible in a well-recognized peer-reviewed journal, the Pan American Journal of Health, Pan American Journal of Public Health. Um, the call for abstracts was issued, 64 abstracts were received, as Dr. Garcia mentioned, 17 went through peer review, and 16 were approved for publication. Um, in the link to the journal site that you will see, we have 15 of those articles. One of them is on its way. It will be finalized shortly. Um, but we also wanted you to know that the uh, that we will also be including an editorial in the special issue, and that will be ready at a later date. Uh, we thought that it would be nice to include the webinar, mention of the webinar, and some of the results that might come out of this uh, webinar in the editorial. So please look out for that um, at a later date. So the articles present activities and research results that could contribute to evidence-based health policies, share lessons learned, identify best practices, and helps to increase the overall visibility of the Collaborating Center's work in the region. And that is one of the things that we are doing in many different ways, not just, not just with the journal. So through the six panel sessions, we'll learn more specifically how this is done, how their work contributes to the organization. So I will thank you very much again and turn it over to Eliane. Thank you very much, Sandy. Very, very comprehensive uh, perspective as well. Uh, and uh, just for everyone's note, we just shared in the chat the link for the special issue. So we invite everyone to visit and to check the titles of the articles that are uh, freshly published in, uh, in the journal. Uh, it's my pleasure to start the, new, the, the first panel that we are going to learn about the papers uh, related to the non-communicable diseases and risk factors. For that, I'm also very pleased to invite Dr. Claudina Caetano. She's our advisor on mental health here in Pajo headquarters. She will have the task to coordinate this uh, panel. Very kindly a uh, reminder for the panelists to please take a look to the timer. We are gonna start for every one of you. Each one of you have <coughs> five minutes. And for the sake of the event, I appreciate that you follow uh, the timer. Thank you very much, Dr. Caetano. You have the floor. Thank you so much, uh, Ms. Eliani. Uh, it is a great pleasure for me to moderate this uh, the first panel, which has to do with non-communicable diseases and risk factors. We have three panelists, and as Ms. Eliani just mentioned, it's so important that you please take your time. We want to be able to respect every panelist, uh, give them the opportunity to present. So the first presenter, for, the, for this panel will be Dr. Arturo Cervantes Trejo. Dr. Cervantes is from the Faculty of Health Science, Universidad Anahuac de Mexico. And he will be talking to us about estimating the economic impact of interpersonal violence in Mexico in 2021. Dr. Cervantes, the mic is yours. Thank you very much. Are you watching my presentation? Yes, we are. Okay, it's a pleasure on behalf of the Harvard uh, Medical School, the program on global surgery and social change, one of the collaborating centers and the Nahuatl University to present this study. As they said, it's about estimating the economic impact of interpersonal violence in 2021 and projecting those costs to 2030. Our work basically uh, does the following. We present an estimate of the economic impact of violence in Mexico starting in 2021, which is equivalent to almost 15% of the national GDP. That's about $192 billion. We uh, use data from different sources to calculate the cost associated with different types of violent incidents. And we estimate that by reducing violence in 50%, uh, we could save at least $110 billion in Mexico, which would benefit significantly all Mexicans. The article emphasizes the importance of science-based prevention 
as the most efficient way to respond to crime and violence and improve citizen security. What we did is we looked at victimization trends from 2000, from the year 2000 to the year 2021. The rates are staggering. Just notice that there's uh, of 126 million Mexicans, more than 20 million have been victims of crime. More than 30 million Mexicans spend on um, private security an average of um, $400 approximately. And there has been more than 40,000, 43,000 homicides last year, giving us an incredible rate. There you see some of the aspects that we looked at in the article. And what we did is using the trends from 2000 to 2021, we projected how things are going in the blue line, if things get worse in the orange line, and if things get better. And using this, we were able to estimate that uh, this year, for example, Mexico is going to lose more than 224 billion pesos in direct and indirect costs related to violence uh, and more specifically related to armed violence. The economic cost of violence is staggering. If we don't do anything about it, this is going to continue increasing. And uh, we conclude that uh, these costs are uh, staggering, 15% of GDP. This year, it's going to grow to around 17% uh, of the national GDP. Uh, and if we could reduce violence, we could uh, stop spending and throwing away so much money and investing it in public health and in development efforts. Our study recommends investing in uh, evidence-based violence prevention strategy to be able to redirect this money to other government services. We need in our country strategic and science-based prevention, uh, and this will help us improve uh, health, uh, combat poverty, and inequality. One of the core problems of this epidemic throughout Mexico and also in the Central American regions are guns, over 70% of crimes and homicides committed in Mexico are committed with US made or manufactured weapons. Thus, we have created this network to prevent gun violence in the Americas because there is a very strong association with the guns produced and imported and into the United States and the crime and violence epidemic that is happening in Mexico. This activity supports the organization's goals and mandates in several ways. We highlight the significant economic impacts of violence, underscoring the need for greater investment in public health strategies to prevent violence and improve citizen security. We emphasize the importance of prevention as the most efficient way to respond to crime and violence. And we underscore the importance of addressing the social determinants of health and promoting health equity. And all of these activities align completely with PAHO's mandate to advocate for health as a fundamental human right and to promote policies and actions that address the social determinants of health and universal health care coverage in the Americas. Thank you. That's five minutes. Thank you so much, Dr. Cervantes, and thanks a lot for sticking to, uh, to the time. Uh, fantastic uh, opportunity to see the value added that the, uh, you bring to the organization. And I think it's definitely opportunities to look at the returns of investment, invest, what does it mean to invest in this area? Because as you mentioned, rightly mentioned, we know that violence has significant economic impact across multiple uh, domains, including the opportunity of, of not, you know, the cost of not engaging in basic prevention policies and failing to invest in other social programs that should be prioritized, such as health, education, infrastructure, and uh, social development. So clearly there is opportunity and I like that you also presented uh, what are you know, the inv importance of investing in evidence-based. So like we have the tools and uh, it's important to be able to start to raise awareness of the need for action to reduce violence in the region of the Americas. 
Uh, definitely, I like that you were able to look at the um, key priorities, uh, how these contribute uh, to the work that we do in the organization is clearly relevant to PAHO since without attention to violence, the health and well-being for all at all ages in the region of the America cannot be assured. So preventing and responding to violence is a core to achieve the sustainable development goals in the America. So again, thank you so much, Dr. Cervantes. Thank you very much. And don't forget that we see guns as a public health nuisance for the Americas. And these guns are coming from the United States. And this is a tragedy that is impeding our health, well being, and development. We appreciate that. Thank you again. And um, now we are going to move in the interest of time uh, to make, as I said, we need to make sure we have other pan we have another uh, presenter in this uh, in this panel. So the second presenter is Dr. Guillermina Natera from the Instituto Nacional de Psiquiatría Ramón de la Fuente Muñiz, Mexico. Uh, my dear friend uh, Guillermina, the mic is yours. And I, you will be speaking to us on detection, detection of alcohol consumption at the first level of care in Mexico during the COVID-19 pandemic. Over to you. Doctora? Buenos días. Eh, no voy a compartir pantalla. Voy a ver, hacer un resumen más mejor del, del artículo. Y eh, eh, muy buenos días a todos y a todos los presentes. Agradezco mucho a la OPS haber promovido esta importante reunión y su invitación a participar en este webinar. Aprecio mucho contar con la presencia de todos los colegas de los centros colaboradores e integrantes de la Organización Panamericana de la Salud y en especial mi querida amiga Claudine. Sobre todo, y sobre todo tener la oportunidad de comentar con ustedes la participación de este centro colaborador en una investigación internacional que junto con otro centro como es el CAMEJ, de Canadá y organismos internacionales pudimos llevar a cabo <coughs> eh, eh, pudimos llevar a cabo esta investigación de carácter cuasi experimental en el primer nivel de atención de los centros de salud de la Ciudad de México orientada a obtener evidencia científica de que es posible la detección temprana y oportuna para la identificación de los riesgos de consumo de alcohol y brindar el consejo breve o referencia al tratamiento. Esta investigación nos dio la oportunidad de elegir el mejor modelo que podría ser aplicado en México. Eh, también la Organización, Mundial de la, eh, la, la Organización Panamericana de la Salud nos promovió y apoyó un webinar el año pasado para presentar el proyecto global que se llevó a cabo simultáneamente en dos países eh, latinoamericanos como fueron Perú y Colombia. Los centros de salud son centros de atención gratuita por lo general asiste la población de más escasos recursos o que no tiene un trabajo fijo y que no tienen acceso a otros servicios de salud como serían los destinados a los trabajadores de empresas privadas, de la seguridad social y los trabajadores del gobierno. Esta investigación se hizo en esos centros y eh, bueno, la metodología eh, utilizada se expresa claramente en el, en el artículo. Participaron 18 centros de salud y 360 profesionales en cuatro abrazos cuasi experimentales. El estudio muestra una comparación del periodo pre-COVID, el periodo de, de confinamiento y el post-confinamiento en la detección oportuna del consumo del alcohol. También de la depresión, pero no presentamos en este caso estos datos. Desde septiembre de 2019 hasta junio de 2021 fue que se levantaron los datos. El 63% de la población estudiada obtuvo un puntaje de consumo de riesgo medio y un 3% de riesgo alto. Esto nos habla de que la población que asiste a estos centros de salud es una población que requiere recibir el consejo breve o una canalización oportuna de tratamiento. La aparición de COVID, de COVID, si bien limitó la afluencia de pacientes a los centros de salud, los que continuaron atendiendo a esta población continuaron aplicando las detecciones y este, en este caso, como en muchas partes del mundo, se redujo el, el consumo porque se redujo la disponibilidad, pero no se anuló ese, no se anuló ese consumo. El estudio nos refleja bebedores de riesgo medio que siguieron detectando eh, que se obtuvieron el 69% antes de COVID y solo disminuyeron en un 59% y los bebedores de alto, de alto riesgo continuaron en un, en un porcentaje semejante al original que fue de 3%. En este estudio podemos ver que el, el riesgo medio 
fue el que de alguna manera se incrementó en, cuando analizamos los datos por los tres periodos pre-COVID, durante el confinamiento y post-confinamiento, obtenemos que el, el consumo medio, de riesgo medio, fue originalmente de 35.8, pero durante el confinamiento se incrementó a 43.9 y posteriormente bajó. O sea, no obstante la, disponibilidad, la no disponibilidad de alcohol, los consumidores tienen la posibilidad de, eh, de obtener el alcohol de alguna manera o porque tenían una reserva. Igualmente, el consumo alto en el confinamiento fue el más elevado, que fue de 5%, sobre todo fue más elevado en relación al post-confinamiento, que fue de 4%. El análisis de retorno de la inversión eh, fue muy importante. El 30% de la población recibiera, recibiera, si recibiera detección oportuna de alcohol podría retrasarse 15.000 muertes cada año. Por cada 100 pesos invertidos en el programa eh, que nosotros elaboramos, que se denominó Escala, se ahorrarían 185 pesos en la, en la utilización de la atención médica. En una proyección a 10 años, se encontró que si se evaluara a una de cada dos personas, se reduciría el consumo de alcohol en los grupos de 15, 74 años y de 69 años o más. Finalmente, los resultados de este proyecto permitieron que una vez más la fundación que nos apoyó económicamente durante los cuatro años anteriores nos volviera a dar una, un importante financiamiento para los dos años posteriores en la que continuaremos como centro colaborador de atención primaria coordinando este nuevo proyecto en esta, en esta fase. Es muy importante que este, este financiamiento nos lo dieron porque una de las partes que reforzó muchísimo fue el que los recursos también pudieran dar respuesta a una de las iniciativas más importantes de la Organización Mundial de la Salud y de la OPS, que es la iniciativa SAFER, que es incluir en el primer nivel de atención la detección oportuna de alcohol y estaban participando y, y, y la participación de este centro colaborado. Lo que es muy importante es que ya tenemos una evidencia científica de este funcionamiento y las autoridades de la Ciudad de México, de la Secretaría de Salud de la Ciudad de México nos han dado todo el apoyo para seguir continuando con esta investigación que consideramos que eh, es muy importante para México, sobre todo porque el alcohol es, más, es el más, eh, problema más serio. Felicit felicidades a la gran revista, muy útil, sobre todo en las Américas y larga vida. Muchas gracias. A, a ti las gracias, definitivamente, mi querida colega y amiga Guillermina por eh, la oportunidad también de continuar colaborando con, con la OPS en este aspecto tan importante como es eh, entender cuál, cuál es la importancia de la detección de la, de la, del alcohol en el primer nivel, que es posible detectar y orientar en el primer nivel de atención. O sea, este es un mensaje muy clave, muy importante, y precisamente porque sabemos que en general, la población de las Américas consume alcohol en un patrón que es peligroso para la salud. Y entonces, cuando se puede orientar, cuando se puede detectar en el primer nivel, creo que esa es una gran ventaja. Estamos hablando de alcohol como un factor de riesgo para más de 200 trastornos de la salud. Así que eh, nos dejas con mucho que pensar, con mucho que seguir trabajando en este tema y muchísimas gracias por estar con nosotros. Gracias. Y para terminar... Este panel eh, tenemos a bien y para estar a tiempo tenemos, we, uh, I'm going, voy a ahora pasarme al, al, al inglés. Eh, thank you so much. And uh, now for the third panelist, uh, we have Dr. Catherine Lam. Dr. Lam, from the Department of Global Pediatric Medicine, St. Jude's Children's Regional Hospital. Dr. Lam, the mic is yours. Thank you so much. We are delighted to share about our work on partnering to implement the Global Initiative for Childhood Cancer in the Americas, prioritizing system strengthening. I'm presenting on behalf of my co-authors, Liliana Vasquez, Patricia Legetto, Soad Fuentes Alabi, Alejandra Gonzalez Ruiz, Sarah Benitez Mahano, Marta Harkin Pardo, Mauricio Massa, John Spencer, Monica Metzger, and Silvana Luciani. My name is Catherine Lam, and I'm the director of the WHO Collaborating Center for Childhood Cancer, based here at St. Jude Children's Research Hospital and with our partners at PAHO. Cancer is a leading cause of death in children and adolescents, and unfortunately here in the region, close to 30,000 children will develop cancer each year. 
And at the current health system's capacity, 10,000 or more will die from this disease. For this reason, because there are dramatic disparities between outcomes in the region and what we know can be achieved at optimal capacity, we have been working hard as WHO Collaborating Center for Childhood Cancer together with PAHO, WHO, regional and global partners to prioritize childhood cancer in the context of system strengthening. In the framework pictured here, we have sought to look with our partners, not only at service delivery, but also at the workforce, at information systems, medical products and technologies, finance and governance, and importantly, family support and community engagements. With that in mind, we have been working to apply a tool called C5, Country Collaboration for Childhood Cancer Control, in order to define and implement priority actions at a regional level and at the national level, strengthen ministry programs for childhood cancer while implementing together the Global Initiative for Childhood Cancer. This Global Initiative for Childhood Cancer was launched at the United Nations in 2018 with WHO and PAHO, and for more information on how we're applying the cure-all approach here in the Americas, you can visit the QR code here at the bottom. Using C5, we have co-hosted regional and national workshops engaging authorities, clinicians, and diverse stakeholders with the goal to map health systems needs and prioritize strategic activities. We have been able to map institutions, organizations, and roles, as well as national strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats across the health system, altogether clarifying the context as well as the actors, the internal and the external factors that impacts children beyond what's happening within one clinic or one hospital. At the same time, we have worked on C4 and C5 modules, developing collaboratively matrices, examining key areas where we can work together to strengthen the health system and collaborative portfolios of work that would fit well with the national priorities. Altogether, able to achieve prioritized sets of activities for actions, considering time as well as local values, political will, and resources. The results from the 10 countries have been applied to inform country-specific as well as regional action plans. And we have engaged with the partners to incorporate the findings into national cancer control planning activities, as well as collaborative work at a regional level. We have also identified implementation success factors, including the capacity to engage actors beyond the clinic, the importance of enabling flexibility, and focusing on co-design with stakeholders. This joint implementation of C5 has catalyzed prioritization and accelerated strategic action to improve policies, capacity, and quality of care for children in the Americas, aligning with PAHO's goals and mandates, and we're very keen to continue supporting ministries to integrate childhood cancer interventions as part of system strengthening. It has been a pleasure working with and learning from the many partners across the Americas, and thanks to PAHO's leadership, we're thrilled to continue to implement and see the growth of Cure All Americas, and together through Cure All to strive for health for all. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Clearly, you have art articulated so well. And uh, not only that, you also the time, you stuck to the time, and that was fantastic. Um, I, I, I think I uh, would want to encourage, in the, in the interest of the time, uh, you know, we want to encourage uh, our viewers to please make sure if you have any question for a great panelists, please make sure you um, you put that in the Q&A. It's, it's ready there for you to ask to write your questions. You will agree with me that these uh, three panelists bring a, a clear added value to the work that we do in PAHO. And uh, thank you again uh, to the three of you, to Dr. Lam, Dr. Cervantes, and uh, Dr. Natera for um, your presentation. So I pass now the mic to my dear colleague um, for the panel two for Dr. Silvia uh, Cassiani. For me, for me. <laughs> thank you, Dr. Uh, Claudina Caetano, for excellent interventions. That's okay. No worries about that. Very, very good uh, comments that uh, tell us that we are in uh, alignment with the centers and what the uh, PAHO is doing and how we are addressing those recommendations. So thank you so very much. 
Without further ado, to start the panel two, which is related to health systems and human resources, we are also pleased to invite to take the moderation, Dr. Silvia Cassiani, who is the advisor for nursing and allied health personal development here in Pajo as well. Dr. Cassiani, the floor, the floor is yours. Obrigada. Muito obrigada, Eliane, um prazer estar com todos vocês nessa importante iniciativa da Organização Pan-Americana da Saúde em aproximar-se dos centros colaboradores, ouvir, ouvi-los e ainda mais de ter uma revista dedicada ao trabalho dos centros colaboradores. Gostaria de dizer que essa sessão vamos tratar especialmente do tema de recursos humanos em saúde e também de uma importante iniciativa de uma rede de centros colaboradores na enfermagem e, e na parteria que temos nessa região. Gostaria de convidar nesse momento Carlos Eduardo Batistella, que junto com um grupo de outros autores desenvolveu o tema Comunidades Epistêmicas e os Desafios na Formação de Técnicos em Saúde na Pandemia de Covid-19. Por favor, Carlos, você tem a palavra. Bom dia, doutora Silvia Cassiani, doutora Janet e doutora Madeleine. É uma satisfação muito grande estar aqui para o lançamento dessa edição especial da Revista Pan-Americana de Saúde dedicada aos centros colaboradores da OMS, OPAS. O artigo que eu vou apresentar foi elaborado em conjunto com as pesquisadoras Ana Beatriz Noronha e Luciana Milagres e discute a atuação de comunidades epistêmicas ligadas à formação de técnicos em saúde por meio da análise das ações do Centro Colaborador para a Educação de Técnicos em Saúde no contexto da pandemia de Covid-19. De acordo com a Rede Internacional de Educação de Técnicos em Saúde, RETS, o trabalho técnico em saúde é considerado como todo aquele realizado pelo conjunto de trabalhadores que exercem atividades técnico-científicas no setor e compreende desde as atividades menos especializadas, realizadas por auxiliares e agentes comunitários de saúde, até as de natureza mais complexa, realizadas por técnicos de nível superior. Embora constituam a maior parte da força de trabalho em saúde em diversos países, pouco se sabe sobre quem são, o que fazem e onde estão esses trabalhadores. Essa invisibilidade contrasta com a crescente relevância de seu papel como alternativa estratégica para as políticas públicas voltadas à redução dos impactos da pandemia nos países, especialmente entre a população mais vulnerável e em regiões remotas e desatendidas. Durante a emergência sanitária, momento em que a cooperação em saúde tornou-se extremamente importante, os desafios para a formação de técnicos ficaram ainda maiores. A multiplicidade de demandas institucionais, pedagógicas e de organização dos serviços de saúde fez com que o trabalho em rede se apresentasse como uma oportunidade de reunir indivíduos e instituições na busca de respostas para problemas comuns, favorecendo a constituição de comunidades epistêmicas. Definida como uma rede de profissionais de diversas disciplinas e formações com experiência e competência reconhecida em um domínio de conhecimento particular, a comunidade epistêmica reivindica autoridade e legitimidade para contribuir com as políticas dentro deste âmbito ou área temática. Seus integrantes compartilham crenças normativas, princípios e explicações causais, noções de validade do conhecimento no domínio de sua especialidade e um empreendimento político comum. São comunidades de pensamento local, nacional ou transnacional que procuram traduzir suas crenças em um discurso social dominante 
e uma prática social. Não são estáticas, homogêneas nem imutáveis. Uma rede de especialistas emerge a partir da articulação de demandas de modo contingente e provisório na própria subjetivação política. Já nos primeiros meses de pandemia, em um seminário virtual organizado pela Rede Internacional de Educação de Técnicos em Saúde, diversas instituições relataram dificuldades comuns que vinham enfrentando na realização de práticas profissionalizantes e na adaptação ao ensino remoto, sofrimento psíquico de professores, alunos e a necessidade de definir novos perfis e atribuições profissionais para os técnicos da atenção primária à saúde. Diante dessas demandas, a Escola Politécnica de Saúde Joaquim Venâncio, da Fiocruz, como centro colaborador da OPAS OMS, propôs a realização de um ciclo de oficinas com o objetivo de reunir docentes, pesquisadores e trabalhadores dos sistemas de saúde em um espaço de troca de experiências e de propostas com para, para as diferentes questões que se apresentaram. Apesar das inúmeras diferenças entre os países, a mobilização das redes envolveu o compartilhamento de diagnósticos e uma racionalidade baseada em valores para ação social, como a defesa intransigente do direito à saúde e do papel estratégico dos técnicos no fortalecimento da atenção primária. Ainda que seja difícil concluir sobre a capacidade das comunidades epistêmicas de influenciar diretamente as políticas nacionais, entendemos que a incorporação do conceito à análise de políticas para a formação de técnicos em saúde pode ser bastante produtiva, fazendo contraponto às abordagens deterministas centradas no Estado e na estrutura econômica, o que permite pensar a participação de atores não governamentais na construção de políticas e oferecer maior complexidade à investigação dos discursos que a hegemonizam. Dessa forma, o Centro Colaborador vem investindo no fortalecimento destas comunidades por meio da promoção de espaços de encontro e diálogo das redes, bem como na investigação do papel das comunidades epistêmicas na circulação de discursos e sentidos que produzem as políticas de currículo na formação dos técnicos em saúde. Obrigada. Muito obrigada, Carlos. Excelente apresentação que nos traz a vista do déficit de recursos humanos na área da saúde que temos, da invisibilidade, não tanto dos recursos humanos como dos técnicos em saúde. Eu não tenho mais o que agradecer o trabalho que vocês realizam no avanço da formação de técnicos de saúde, não somente no Brasil, mas em toda a América Latina, e para nós é um prazer sempre trabalhar com a Escola Joaquim Venâncio, nosso centro colaborador na formação de técnicos de saúde. Passo agora a palavra à doutora Janete Rigby, e a doutora Janete Rigby vai nos contar sobre o fortalecimento da força de trabalho em saúde no Caribe, descrevendo a experiência em três excelentes e, e talentosos países como Barbados, Grenada e San Vincent in Grenadines. Doutora Gigby, Rigby, sorry, doutora Janet Rigby, é, a sua palavra, Sim. por favor. Thank you. Can everyone see my screen? Yes, we can Hello. see your screen. Thank you very much. And I'm speaking to you today from Mi'kma'ki, the traditional territory of the Mi'kmaq people. I'm sorry. And I would just like to... Um, Dr. Rigby, yes? I'm going to, inter to interrupt you. Would you mind to uh, put, put a slideshow, please? Yes, it is on the slideshow. Is that not showing? No, ma'am, it's not. Oh, dear. Let me just exit and try that again. Your presentation is showing. It just needs to be put on presentation mode. 
Yes, I'm not quite sure what's happening there. Um, can someone else? Yes, it's not. Um, my controls are not working. Dr. Uh, Rigby, just to have your slides again and click in the bottom, in the small, in the small, small cup, and we will see the presentation mode. If you can share again your slides and we can follow you in the in the presentation mode. Sure, I'll just keep talking in the meantime. I'm representing Dr. Gail Tomlin Murphy, the director of our collaborating center and lead author of our paper. Um, the addressing the move towards universal health and care being through strengthening the health workforce. In this paper, we um, actually highlighted the development of the uh, HRH policies and action plans in Barbados, Grenada, and St. Vincent and the Grenadines. These policies and action plans set out strategic actions aimed at strengthening the health workforce within each country. Um, I'd like to acknowledge our co-authors, Dr. Benjamin Poretis from Pajo, Washington, and Karen Gladback from Pajo, Washington, who is now retired. Within the development of the policies and action plans, and I'll ask if you can see that now. I don't think it is sharing. Um, so I, I apologize for the technical difficulties here. Um, but uh, basically what we did was we used the same policy development process and we worked in collaboration with Ministries of Health and PAHO. And um, we conducted a situational analysis which analyzed the current health policy context and included stakeholder discussions on challenges facing the health workforce and strategies to address uh, the workforce challenges and strategies to address them. The intersectoral stakeholder consultations involve meetings with various ministries, such as health, education, and finance, and workshops with stakeholders from government, health facilities, educational institutions, NGOs and unions. These consultations were a key factor in gathering information and formulating the policies and action plans. Through this process, we identified the key HRH priority, priority areas to be addressed. The policy provided the key strategic areas of action with short, medium, and long-term activities within each priority area. And the two-year action plan identified activities and sub-activities and provided a monitoring and evaluation framework. The policies and action plans focused on priority areas of leadership and governance, HRH planning capacity, strengthening primary health care, organization of roles, pre and post licensure education and training, retention and recruitment, deployment and utilization, intersectoral and external partnerships for sustainability, HRH information systems, and HRH research. And next slide. The cross-sectional analysis of the findings found that HRH challenges and priority areas were consistent across the countries, resulting in similar policy priority actions which also align with the regional lines of action for strengthening HRH for universal health, which are to one, strengthen and consolidate governance and leadership on HRH, develop conditions and capacities in HRH to expand access to health and health coverage with equity and quality, and partner with the education sector to respond to the needs of health systems in transformation toward universal access to health and universal health coverage. 
the consistencies in HRH challenges and priority areas. Um, the consistencies in HRH challenges and priority areas in these countries and across the Caribbean community lend support for sub-regional collaboration on HRH strengthening. The CARICOM, with supporting facilitation by the PAHO Sub-Regional Program for the Caribbean, now has a permanent commission on HRH to advance action on HRH across member countries. Next slide, please. Doctor, doctor, I'm sorry to inter keep interrupting you. Would you like to speak closer to the because we have background, no background noise and echo from your mic, and it's difficult in the work from the translators. Oh, I'm sorry about that. Can you hear me better now? Thank you. Okay, certainly. So the activity in our paper aligns with and supports the work of PAHO's Department of Health Systems and Services, and particularly the HRH unit, with specific focus on developing human resources for health. The development of HRH policies and action plans that are aligned with national, sub-regional, and regional strategies provide relevant strategic directions aimed at strengthening the health workforce, which is a vital component to a strong, resilient health system. Our center's mandate is to build local and global capacity to support needs-based planning of health systems in HRH. And with a renewed focus on HRH, our center is poised to provide ongoing opportunities to collaborate with PAHO, the CARICOM HRH Caribbean Commission, and member countries as they work to achieve their HRH strengthening objectives. Thank you. And my apologies for the technical. Muito obrigada, doutora Rigby, e foi muito interessante ouvir sobre o desenvolvimento de planos de saúde, a importância que nestes planos de saúde esteja incluído o componente de recursos humanos para a saúde, também escutar áreas prioritárias que os países devem é, in, inverter em recursos humanos, como planejamento, retenção e recrutamento, investigação e educação, e principalmente, ao final, ouvir que desenvolver recursos humanos é instrumental para fortalecer a atenção primária em saúde e fortalecer o acesso e a cobertura universal em saúde. Muito obrigada por seu trabalho junto a, a, ao Departamento de Sistemas de Saúde em, eh, na Organização Pan-Americana de Saúde. Dando continuidade, gostaríamos de convidar a doutora Madeline Neigo. A doutora Ma Madeline vai mostrar a vocês uma interessante rede que, te que temos, uma rede pan-americana de centros colaboradores em enfermagem e parteria, e pode ser muito interessante para outros centros colaboradores que assim desejam formar as suas próprias redes de trabalho. Doutora Madeline, a palavra é sua, muito obrigada. Good morning, Sylvia. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. I hope you can hear me. Sylvia? Yes, we can hear you very well. Excellent. Good morning. Good morning. Happy to be here and to speak about this brief report that discussed the development and the results and advantages of developing the Pan American Nursing and Midwifery Collaborating Centers Network. Uh, so I developed this brief report with Dr. Andrea Bauman and Danielle Denwood, both of whom are based at McMaster University's Collaborating Center. I am based with NYU, New York University's Myers College of Nursing Collaborating Center, 
which is a collaborating center in geriatric nursing education. The director of that center is Dr. Nancy Van Devanter. This project that Andrea and Danielle and I did was to really summarize uh, the development of the network and to talk about the outcomes that we consider to be valuable so that there's consideration for how other groups may wish to develop a network and what that advantage would be to have a network of collaborating centers. So essentially the network has allowed us to communicate with colleagues and to connect among the collaborating centers and various colleagues in them to communicate and discuss issues, exchange information about funding, exchange information about resources, and to talk about the uh, general ways in which we are implementing our technical assignments and our technical goals to strengthen capacity at PAHO, to build uh, the capacity to, to meet our universal healthcare needs, but to also do that in relation to our various areas of expertise. So for us at NYU, that is aging. The exchange of information has really helped all of us as representatives of collaborating centers to develop a consensus within our groups to learn about the trends within our own profession nursing and how those trends are supporting our work within the WHO and Pan PAHO collaborating centers. It helps us to con communicate on the policies and procedures that come down from PAHO to work on our development uh, of terms of reference, to share information across collaborating centers and to develop ways in which we advance our learning. One of the most instrumental ways was to develop an annual research, actually a biennial research conference where all of the uh, schools of nursing and related schools within the PAHO region come together once every two years to present research papers about the work within the region and what nursing and collaborative healthcare um, agencies are doing to help us meet our, our goals. So that research conference advances our goals of mentorship uh, which links very closely to our goals of capacity building within nursing and other health resources. It also reinforces our evidence-based approach. So those are some of the re results of the centers, exchanging information, uh, providing support to one another, learning about the work of other centers and the ways in which we can collaborate. I was also asked to speak a little bit about what we would advise another group of collaborating centers should they wish to form this kind of network. So this 20 year old network basically has annual meetings, representatives from each collaborating center, they send two representatives and a website and a repository of our work. So we have created structure so anyone hoping to develop a network of collaborating centers has to give some thoughts to what kind of structure would be feasible, what kind of structure is the most efficient, and what would be the mission of that network? Why would you even go about this? What do we hope to accomplish? It's helpful, of course, if you are all able to meet in person because that one-to-one -one contact builds relationships facilitates our information sharing, and also allows us to work with others in developing various projects. It's important to choose a model that provides some structure. Uh, it took us a while to do that in our incipient years, uh, trying to have a mission that speaks to the meaningfulness of our work. And I think I can see from Sylvia's face that I have used my time. <laughs> Uh, I, I do want to say it's been most gratifying to be part of the center. Dr. Bauman at, and Ms. Denwood and I are very pleased that this brief report will be included in this special PAHO issue. And I want to thank you for asking me to participate this morning. It's a pleasure. 
Obrigada, Madeline. Thank you, Madeline. E eu convidaria os participantes desse webinar para que conheçam e leiam esse artigo e a experiência dessa rede de centros colaboradores em enfermagem e, e parteria, porque eu tenho orgulho de ser um, o responsável técnico por esses centros colaboradores e o trabalho deles em rede tem tornado o, o meu trabalho é, e o trabalho deles em conjunto é, engrandece a todos nós. E dizer que há também uma rede global de centros colaboradores em enfermagem e parteria, que também é um exemplo muito interessante. Muito obrigada aos três panelistas e passo novamente a palavra a Elaine para o seguimento. Muito obrigada. Obrigada, Silvia. Uh, thank you also for the diversity of languages. That is one of uh, the goals for the organization to be able to communicate and to strengthen this, the multilingualism. So thank you very much for moderating this very important panel also in Portuguese. Uh, muito obrigada novamente. Uh, now uh, let's begin panel three. No rest for us is very intense, but very interesting. Uh, thank you very much for the panelists who have uh, attended so far. We understand that many of you already have all their commitments. So uh, before you, we, you leave the, 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 the webinar, thank you very much. And thank you for the patience for the next ones uh, who are still have the, the work. Uh, my special recognition to all PAHO uh, collaborative centers located in Cuba because we just heard that all of you are joined together from uh, our PAHO country office who opened the space for you to enjoy and to join us uh, together. So thank you again and our recognition also to uh, our country office for, for doing this uh, for us today. Uh, I'd like to invite now Doc, Mr. Olger Gonzalez who is the human rights advisor also here in PAHO to lead our panel three, which is regarding the pandemic preparedness. Go ahead, um, Mr. Gonzalez. You have the floor to moderate the section. Bom dia, Eliane, muito obrigado. I hope you, I hope you hear me well. Um, it is my pleasure to introduce this morning, Mr. Kashish Aneja, from the O'Neill Institute for National and Global Health Law of Georgetown University in the USA. They prepared a special report on COVID-19 in the Americas, the role of collaborating centers in understanding lessons and best practices in pandemic preparedness and response. Uh, Mr. Aneja, you have the floor. Thanks, Olga. I, I'll just share my screen. Uh... I hope my screen is visible, right? Yes. Perfect, thank you so much. A very warm good morning, everyone. I'm Kashish Shaneja, public health lawyer with the Center for Transformation Health Law at the O'Neill Institute for National and Global Health Law, Georgetown University. Today, I'll be presenting a paper titled COVID-19 in the Americas, the role of collaborating centers in understanding lessons and best practices in pandemic preparedness and response. The COVID-19 pandemic has Post serious gaps in the international and multilateral systems oh that God. relied on for decades. Yeah. Can I just ask you to speak a little bit slower? Okay, sure. Just to sure, allow, sure, sure. allow our interpreters to not miss anything very important that of you Thank you very of much. Of course, thank you. Sure, of course. The COVID-19 pandemic has exposed serious gaps in the international and multilateral systems that were relied on for decades to coordinate global responses to crisis. In many ways, the exposure of these gaps has been troubling uh, wake-up call that our current frameworks, when tested, proved inadequate. This wake-up call, while it must lead to meaningful change at the international level, it should not overshadow the important work that has happened at the regional level. This paper uh, is based on the work done by the O'Neill Institute in, in its capacity as a WHO collaborating center, and it argues that regional bodies can and should play critical roles in supporting outbreak preparedness and response. This paper identifies gaps in current response and preparedness mechanisms and examines both the solutions provided by PAHO during the pandemic 
and the important role for the organization in building sustainable and, and resilient global systems in the future. The O'Neill Institute has a long history of concretely supporting PAHO's uh, work prior to COVID-19. The Center for Transformation Health Law has been heavily involved in supporting the World Health Assembly in the creation of an international legal instrument for pandemic outbreaks. The O'Neill Institute, along with the Foundation for National Institute of Health, convened 30 of the world's leading authorities on global health law, financing, biomedical science, implementation and emergency response, along with leaders from prominent international organizations. The global convenings were followed by regional consultations, which focused on the unique challenges faced by the countries in the region. These high level expert consultations generated in-depth discussions on weaknesses and the persisting gaps in global pandemic preparedness and what a new international agreement might include to address them. So, the, uh, so our paper identifies three gaps uh, in the current response and preparedness mechanisms. The first is the gap in technical capacity at the country level. There have been uh, the high level experts identified a lack of technical capacity at the national level as a serious impediment to the effective implementation of policies. Testing capacity is another area where PAHO played a key role and recognized a need to be involved moving forward. In addition to technical, medical and health system capacity, the regional consultations highlighted a serious gap in communication capacities, both within PAHO and in national governments. The second gap has been in information technology infrastructure. Discussions about a possible international pandemic instrument have included conversations about the role of data sharing and surveillance. The consultations highlighted a lack of information technology and digital capabilities as a fundamental challenge that impeded data sharing and surveillance during the COVID-19 pandemic. Finally, there are gaps in coordination which have been identified. These challenges included those faced in facilitating coordination between countries and the WHO health offices in Geneva, to those identified by the PAHO officials in coordinating with other WHO regional offices and those between PAHO and other multilateral organizations. The paper also deals with the roles of PAHO in addressing these gaps. While there are, of course, a number of roles, important roles that PAHO has played throughout the COVID-19 pandemic, yet our paper discusses broadly two areas in which the O'Neill Institute has seen the most innovative and widespread contributions. The first include standard setting, which saw PAHO's direct influence on developing and changing national level policies, promoting evidence-based best practices, and providing direct technical support to governments. There have been regional efforts to increase vaccine uh, access, which saw the Latin American Caribbean region and PAHO working in close partnership with the Inter-American Development Bank, as well as COVAX as part of a broad strategy towards vaccine access. The paper discusses these two areas with examples of fruitful regional collaboration and solutions to multilateral problems. These areas show that regional institutions are irreplaceable as organizations, individuals living and working in the realities on the ground, international organizations, dictating priorities and policies. Collaborating centers such as the O'Neill Institute can assist in fulfilling essential surveillance and evaluation functions not only does the Institute have ample access to academic resources and expertise in law and policy surveillance, its experience is also complemented by involvement with other international bodies. Just last year, the Institute conducted the first comprehensive analysis of vaccine development agreements entered into by SEPI. These exercises are just small examples of the important work being done at collaborating centers and highlight the role of collaborating centers at critical resources in support of PAHO. By harnessing the collaborating center expertise and resources, and working together to highlight both successes and outstanding challenges at PAHO, we hope to move progressively towards the improvement and protection of health of all those living in the American regions. Thank you for having me today. Thank you very much, Kashish, uh, for your exposition. Um, the, fact, the fact is that we have critical gaps in local, national, regional, and international public health preparedness and response mechanisms which are needed to ensure coherence and cooperation between international and regional mechanisms, right? And that continues to hinder both global and domestic responses to the spread in this case of COVID uh, virus, but we also are gonna face more in the future. So just to take one example of the gaps that you mentioned, uh, there was a serious gap in communications capacity, both uh, within PAHO and national governments 
So governments in the region have been faced with a difficult balancing act uh, between communicating uncertainty and sharing clear, reliable, transparent information to curb the spread of the virus. So that created this information. Uh, this together with the lack of IT and digital, digital capabilities as fundamental challenges, um, lead us to think on human rights again. Yes, we're talking about right to health, personal integrity of people, but access to information in times of uncertainty is related with credibility, accountability, transparency of governments, and ultimately their legitimacy in democratic societies. So one of, of the things that you, in your, in your uh, special report addressed was that PAHO worked to connect governments with organizations that could promote a holistic and intersectional approach in handling the pandemic. In times of emergency, states' obligations under international law of human rights and humanitarian law are not suspended, but rather persist. And this is particularly relevant when talking about persons and groups in situations or conditions of vulnerability who should be protected under. So we can, we can think on all the efforts that we try to do within the countries and the organizations, efforts by the Inter-American Commission in addressing indigenous people's needs, migrants, children, and women who faced increased uh, domestic violence, extreme poverty in human settlements, when overcrowding simply impeded the implementation of certain preventive measures. Uh, so human security is more than a valid concern. We cannot agree, therefore, more with you that collaborating centers like the O'Neill Institute can and should continue to highlight and support PAHO's work. And we must continue to consider the benefits of developing an international instrument on pandemic preparedness to address weaknesses and persisting gaps in global pandemic preparedness. With that said, I appreciate very much for your attention and thank you again, Kashish. Eliane, passo a palavra. Thank you. Muito obrigada. Thank you very much. And it's also important and interesting to see how the papers and how the work by the collaborative centers can be uh, strengthened from this kind of dialogues. Uh, on the panel five, we are going to talk about digital health and infodemics. And uh, we are going to learn a very interesting project to fight misinformation. So there's a lot of opportunities for the collaborative work from with the collaborative centers. We are running a little bit late on this event. So uh, let me introduce uh, our next panelists. We are not going to go straight to the next panel for the manuscripts, but now we're going to have the opportunity to learn a little bit more about the Pan American Journal of Public Health and its perspective of publishing this uh, special issue. Uh, I give the floor to Dr. Damian Vasquez, who is the managing editor for the Pan American Journal of Public Health here in the Pan American uh, Health Organization. The floor is yours, Damian. Muchas gracias, Eliane. Buenos días a todos. Entiendo que están viendo mi, mi pantalla con la diapositiva de apertura. Y esta presentación es un paréntesis entre los temas que estamos conversando, que son el verdadero interés de este webinar. Y como todos los paréntesis, va a ser muy breve. Pero nos parece importante compartir um, desde la perspectiva de la revista un par de reflexiones. Como ya se dijo, la revista eh, tiene, ha cumplido en, 19, en el año pasado 100 años de existencia y eso la convierte en una de las revistas de salud pública más antiguas de, del continente. Y al ser un proyecto transversal de la organización, cuyos resultados se vuelcan a todos los países, la hacen muy parecida a los centros colaboradores, que son otro proyecto transversal y cuyos resultados son útiles para muchos países. A veces se eh, surge la pregunta en un taller de redacción científica, ¿para qué publicar? Y la respuesta simple es, porque lo que no está publicado no existe. Sabemos que en el 1500 se sabía aproximadamente esto sobre la gestación humana, y lo sabemos porque Leonardo no solo investigó ese tema, sino que además lo escribió, y lo dejó dibujado, como se ve en ese cuaderno a la derecha. Y lo que saben los cirujanos de anatomía hoy en día, en buena medida se edificó sobre lo que los primeros anatomistas publicaron en libros, como el que se ve a la izquierda. 
Si nos vamos 500 años hacia el presente, llegamos a las revistas científicas y podríamos decir que el papel de una revista científica es transformar lo que se ve a la izquierda en lo que se ve a la derecha. Las diferencias son evidentes y son bien visibles, sin embargo, yo creo que lo que más se ve no es lo más importante. Es claro que un manuscrito es un, un documento que no ha sido revisado ni editado y que un artículo científico sí ha pasado por esos pasos que han aumentado su calidad. Sin embargo, eso no es lo más importante. Lo más importante, creo yo, es que un manuscrito es simplemente un documento que ha sido compartido entre un grupo de autores y una revista y nadie más sabe de esos resultados de la investigación. En cambio, un artículo publicado es un, una evidencia científica que está disponible en forma amplia para la comunidad académica, los profesionales de la salud, tomadores de decisiones e incluso para la población general. Y aquí entonces es cuando... Esa, esa evidencia científica, si se lleva a la acción, toma vuelo y se puede generar un círculo virtuoso, porque los investigadores pueden usar esa información de un artículo dado para edificar nueva, nueva información y publicar otros, otros artículos. Los profesionales de la salud pueden cambiar su conducta práctica en el consultorio en cuanto a diagnóstico o terapéutica con base en algo nuevo. Los tomadores de decisiones también pueden informar sus políticas de salud o normativas y emitir este, leyes o, 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 o regulaciones que hagan a la mejora de la salud pública. Y por último, la población general también, generalmente a través de los medios de comunicación, pueden llegar a, a nuevas investigaciones y cambiar su modo de vida hacia estilos más saludables. Entonces, esta es en realidad la, la, la verdadera importancia de la publicación científica y lo que en última instancia nos interesa en la revista. De manera que solo me resta invitarlos a visitar el sitio dedicado al número especial. Si van a la dirección de la revista, van a ver en la parte media del sitio web un, un sector dedicado a los números especiales y ahí van a encontrar todos los eh, títulos que son los enlaces a los, a los artículos concretos con los cuales van a poder acceder al, al, al texto completo y descargar el artículo. Como ven, los temas son variados, eso es algo interesante de este número especial, no es un número dedicado a un solo tema, sino a muchos temas. Y otra particularidad es que muchos de los artículos no se enfocan en un solo país, sino que han, son producto de investigaciones que se han llevado a cabo en muchos países, de manera que eso le da un interés regional. Por último, quiero agradecer a muchas personas. A veces decimos que la publicación es un esfuerzo en conjunto, es un trabajo en equipo. Y se me ocurrió hacer una cuenta rápida de cuántas personas tuvieron un manuscrito dado cualquiera directamente en sus computadoras. Si decimos que hubo cinco autores y lo han revisado tres pares y lo han manejado dos editores, un tipógrafo, un traductor y otros profesionales que han intervenido en esa en esa sucesión de, de acciones, en un manuscrito cualquiera pueden haber intervenido 25 personas directamente, lo cual transforma a estos 15 artículos que tenemos aquí en un conjunto de, de 250 o 300 personas que han intervenido en esta publicación. De manera que yo quiero agradecerles a, a todos ustedes, a todos los que han intervenido en esta, en esta cadena de, de acciones, en particular a los autores, a quienes me ha dado gusto conocer personalmente y ponerles en la cara a los nombres que venimos viendo hace, hace varios meses. Lo mismo que a todas las personas que nos han ayudado desde el comité editorial y a todos los centros colaboradores cuyos manuscritos no hemos podido publicar, pero que también nos han enviado en su momento sus resúmenes y, por cierto, valoramos mucho la cooperación que, no, que nos brinda. Así que a todos, muchas gracias y te devuelvo, Eliane, la moderación. Muchas gracias, Damián. Excelente exposición y nuevamente la invitación a todos que puedan leer, conocer y someter sus manuscritos que se van a volver en papers uh, en nuestra revista Panamericana de Salud Pública. Eh, como ya hemos hablado, estamos bastante retrasados en el tiempo, así que me gustaría mucho de invitar a nuestra próxima moderadora, la doctora Patricia Morsch, que es nuestra asesora uh, de eh, Health Aging, I'm sorry, uh, <laughs> the advisor on Health Aging here in the Pan American Health Organization as well, who will moderate the panel four, which is related to health throughout the life course 
and occupational health. Dr. Marsh, the floor is yours. Once again, thank you very much for being here with us. Obrigada, Eliane. It is a great pleasure to moderate this panel, and I appreciate the opportunity to be here with you all today. So before I pass the floor to our first speaker, I would like to remember that each presenter will have five minutes to deliver their presentation. Uh, now I would like to introduce our first speaker, Dr. Jerry Spiegel from the EU School of Population and Public Health from University of British Columbia, Canada. Dr. Spiegel, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I should be loading right now. Yes, we can see your presentation, just have to be yes, added okay. in the presenting yes. mode. Okay, no, thank you very much. That's yeah. perfect. I'm, I'm actually speaking to you today from uh, Vancouver, Canada, which is uh, on the uh, traditional ancestral and sated territory of the Musqueam people. Um, and uh, my name is Jerry Spiegel. I'm a professor in the um, University of British Columbia um, and co-director with Dr. Annalie Yassi of the Global Health Research Program. And although we've enjoyed very much our collaborations with uh, collaborating centers across the Americas, I'll be speaking today about a project we undertook with a collaborating center partners in South Africa at the National Institute of Occupational Health around the theme of protecting healthcare workers during a pandemic. What can WH Go Collaborating Center Research Partnership contribute? And this was a partnership that was developed over 15 years ago. Interestingly, I had a meeting coming together at a meeting of WHO collaborating centers. So half of our team of authors is from South Africa and half is from Canada. What we tried to uh, undertake in this research that was funded from the International uh, Development Research Center and in, in Canada and the Canadian Institutes of Health Research was a response to the crisis posed by the emergence of the COVID pandemic. And uh, we were put in, we were called on to say what could what insights could be added to the challenge of what works to protect healthcare workers during a pandemic in what context, using what mechanism to achieve what outcome, to really look at what the best practices would be and how we could develop that, share that, and build on the strengths of collaborating centers to develop that further, but sensitive very much to the context, which is one of the shortcomings to enable a good appreciation of what best practices uh, really can mean in practice. Uh, to do this, we undertook a realist synthesis of projects. A realist synthesis is a method increasingly popular in implementation science that focuses particular attention on the context. That means at different levels from the macro, global, national level to the meso, institutional level to the local micro level of, of the individual worker. Um, but in this case, we weren't only looking at the realist appreciation of interventions, but of the process of research collaboration. So we were including consideration of research, researcher positionality. Also, especially looking at the mechanism, which in our case also looked at the service relationships that each collaborating center had, in addition to being researchers, being engaged in supporting best practices and providing service. And finally, to be looking at the outcomes that could be achieved through interventions. And in looking at this, we were drawing on an area of knowledge known as partnership synergy theory, which really looks at the process of partnerships, which, as you know, has been recognized itself as an important issue, partnerships as a sustainable development goal. So within this, we had a particular focus on an assessment of what the role of a WHO collaborating center partnership was in each study and overall. 
So we actually drew on seven projects that we conducted in this research program, uh, each of which has been published and uh, fueron so analizados. Entonces los detalles de estos esos detalles de estos estudios están disponibles porque ya fueron publicados. Entonces, income disparity within countries and economic disparity. Having a comparative north-south perspective gave us a particular strength in looking at these questions. And we indeed saw that uh, there were a greater um, challenges faced where there was more disparity, which we'll share with you in a minute. We looked at workplace assessment, drawing on the strengths, particularly of our colleagues in South Africa, in providing service to uh, to workplaces, healthcare workplaces around the country, and drawing on collaborative work we had done using the WHO ILO WorkSafe tool to promote health and safety workplaces in the healthcare work setting. Um, so we were looking here, for example, at what would be the effects of policy and compliance with good practices, which is what we saw that uh, that in fact in those settings that had policies and good practices they were getting better results in terms of dealing with the challenge of covid we had four uh, workplace studies that were looking at comparative perspectives through our collaboration cohort studies in both south africa and in canada where we would be looking at the effects of control measures taken in vaccination And then in the Canadian context, a nested case control study where we look deeper at effects of exposure factors and control measures, whereas in the South African context, had the opportunity to follow up some previous collaborative work together to conduct a mental health study that in particular would look at the effect of support and training to workers facing this emergent challenge. And finally, building on what was probably the strongest history of our uh, collaboration between uh, collaborating centers, looking at how strengthened information systems um, could contribute to meeting a challenge. And in this case, we were really looking at the readiness and feasibility of strengthening workplace systems facing this challenge that was building on um, a new system that's actually widely used now in South Africa that was a result of, of, a, of an information technolo technology transfer that we developed uh, starting over 15 years ago. So what were the conclusions and results? As I mentioned, lower resource countries with, with higher economic disparity were indeed perceiving greater occupational health risk and less acceptable mitigation measures to provide protection at the onset which is an important issue for preparedness because uh, this won't be the last pandemic challenge um, we're, we'll be facing, unfortunately. We looked at rigorously adopting environment, uh, occupational health uh, measures in cases where we saw these being adopted. These indeed afford greater protection. Um, and when it came to the mental health, which is a huge burden in this context, We saw some evidence of training and preventive initiatives uh, contributing to reducing workplace stress. Uh, we saw the value being placed on information systems, although this work is mostly ongoing now, um, but also that, that we could use the information systems to identify healthcare workers most at risk and then intensify the protective actions being taken. Um, So the CMO, the Context Mechanism Outcome Analysis, um, showed that, uh, that in working through a WHO Collaborating Center partnership, this not only enabled knowledge sharing, but from the different perspectives, particularly from the Global North and the Global South, this could provide greater insights as, into what works, what's needed, what's feasible. 
uh, to provide worker protection. Now, what the implications of this for PAHO and, um, um, and beyond is when we meet a challenge like the pandemic, um, we need particular uh, focus on protecting healthcare workers as we've seen. And we were able to, through this collaboration, see the value of actually pointing to specific measures uh, that could be taken for this protection. But beyond that, um, the, the strengths of the WHO and PAHO collaborating center networks create a tremendous basis for generating further knowledge and doing this in a bi-directional learning way across global north, global south, but just across the whole networks. This draws on not only the strengths of collaborating centers among themselves, but each collaborating center in our case had rich partnerships with local decision makers, local government uh, uh, health authorities. And in, and in this case, uh, strong partnerships with practitioners. So this really would intensify the mutual learning and ultimately the sharing that could reinforce work across uh, the PAHO network, particularly for healthcare worker protection. Thank you, gracias, obrigado. Thank you very much, Dr. Spiegel. Very important and relevant topic to present, especially in the current scenario that we have now still battling COVID-19, but of course, to better prepare for other health emergencies that might arise. Uh, we know that sharing best practices, information, and developing research are key aspects for informed decisions. So uh, partnerships, such as with the collaborating centers, can be great assets to address different areas as presented by the different projects that you analyzed, and especially for countries with more, more disparities, more difficulties, difficulties, and the countries that will have probably more negative effects in these uh, emergencies. So thank you very much. Uh, I'll immediately pass the floor for the next speaker because, we, uh, because of the time. So the next presenter is Dr. Fernando Diaz Barriga de la Facultad de Medicina uh, de la Universidad Autónoma de San Luis Potosí, Mexico. And Dr. Diaz Barriga, adelante, por favor. Acuerdo del tiempo de cinco minutos para la presentación. Oops. Eh, sí me ven, pero no puedo hacer la de toda la presentación. ¿No puedes poner en modo presentación? No. Pero bueno, voy okay. a ir rápido. Eh, eh, nosotros trabajamos sitios contaminados en América Latina. Y en los sitios contaminados, la salud ambiental infantil tiene que ser protegida. La Organización Panamericana de la Salud y la Organización Mundial de la Salud han venido trabajando fuertemente en estas áreas y varios centros colaboradores, no nada más el nuestro, hay centros colaboradores en Uruguay, aquí mismo en México, en Estados Unidos, Canadá, en fin, estamos colaborando con estas instituciones. ¿A qué le llamamos sitios contaminados actualmente? Eh, los sitios contaminados tienen cuatro amenazas muy graves. La quimicalización, el mundo está lleno de químicos, eh, más de 300 mil eh, de uso común. La contaminación que mata más que la pandemia, por supuesto tenemos la COVID-19 ahorita, y finalmente el cambio climático. Estas cuatro amenazas que afectan a la salud infantil convergen en los sitios contaminados. Eh, en estos sitios, las amenazas químicas, físicas y biológicas se sumen a las condiciones de salud y a las condiciones sociales. Todo esto ya lo saben todos ustedes. El problema es qué hacemos, qué hacemos más allá de los diagnósticos, qué hacemos más allá de la información basada en evidencia. 
Entonces, creamos una estrategia que se llama escenarios humanitarios, donde planteamos la construcción de salud a partir de la eliminación de las amenazas. Sí, la idea es eliminar las amenazas químicas, físicas, biológicas, ecológicas y sociales, basados en el derecho a la salud y teniendo como foco a los escenarios humanitarios. Eh, no puedo pasar la siguiente. Eso, gracias. Entonces, eh, esta unidad RISC de riesgos infantiles en sitios contaminados tiene cinco elementos. La formación de talento, tenemos cursos inclusive con la OPS, tenemos programas de divulgación, de abogacía basada en los derechos humanos y de vigilancia. Y finalmente una estrategia que hemos denominado P6, si me da la siguiente por favor. Esta P6 incluye seis fases, la de planeación, participación, priorización, prevención, promoción y protección. La idea es crear capas preventivas en las comunidades basadas en los derechos humanos, exactamente con el uso del cubrebocas para la COVID, cuáles son los elementos que podemos trabajar a nivel local con la comunidad para proteger la salud de los niños. En el artículo van ejemplos en sitios contaminados por mercurio, en minería artesanal y en barrios urbanos marginados. Pero estos seis elementos, si me da la siguiente, eh, están de acuerdo con el enfoque P5 de la Agenda 2030. Planeación, participación, priorización, prevención, promoción y protección. Todos estos elementos tienen ya estructuras para trabajar a nivel de comunidad. La siguiente, por favor. Esto, entonces, podemos utilizarlos para la, la con cuando convergen los riesgos planetarios a nivel comunitario y actualmente ya estamos con, eh, previendo con la Organización Panamericana de la Salud y con la Organización de Estados Americanos trabajar en esta estrategia en 10 países y en 100 escenarios humanitarios. Cre queremos formar recursos humanos en todas las Américas para que los niños finalmente puedan decir tenemos futuro. Yo agradezco a la OPS esta oportunidad, es muy importante que los centros colaboradores entiendan que eh, los retos actuales no son los retos de hace 100 años cuando empezó la revista. Tenemos que estar juntos a favor de la salud pública. Muchísimas gracias. Muchas gracias a usted, doctor. Y uh, the, the role of the environment for health is already very clear and important work, uh, area of work for PAHU. And the work presented has the focus on, on children, but I would like to highlight that it's very important to consider a life course perspective that is another area of work currently in, in PAHU. So the contaminations and experience in these environments can impact health trajectories. So this study impacts directly children, but on a broader perspective can impact their development and so favor better health in other ages as well. As Dr. Diaz Barriga uh, said, uh, engaging, having a better future for, for all. So uh, thank you very much. And to continue the session, I introduce our next speaker, Dr. Semi Almashat from the Occupational Health Program of the University of Maryland, Baltimore, uh, from the United States. Dr. Amashat, the microphone is yours. There we go. Uh, sorry about that. Uh, can you all hear me and see my... We can hear you, but we cannot see your screen uh, now. Now, there yes. Okay, great. Good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Sami Almashad. Uh, I'm an occupational medicine physician here at the University of Maryland in Baltimore in the United States. 
and uh, together with my colleagues here uh, in the US and Dr. Muller Ramirez uh, in Chile, we've published an article in this month's issue uh, on carcinogenic drug exposure among health sector workers. So this is exposure uh, among health sector workers to chemotherapy drugs in the workplace and the need for exposure assessment and surveillance. So what is the problem? The problem is that uh, the number of cancers and therefore the amount of antineoplastic drug use, which is chemotherapy drug use, is going to be increasing a lot in low and middle income countries over the next two decades. And some of these drugs used for chemotherapy can cause cancer in people who are exposed to them. And this includes health sector workers, and these can be workers producing the drugs, workers administering the drugs, workers cleaning up after the drugs are administered. Uh, so the objectives of our report were four, fourfold. One is to review the existing research and prevention efforts, much of which has been led by PAHO and its collaborating centers, occupational health collaborating centers, aimed at reducing occupational cancer in the Americas. We wanted to discuss how very robust exposure assessment and outreach work by PAHO and its CCs and form the basis of exposure mitigation efforts among health sector workers. Uh, we also present original exposure assessment data that were generated by our first author, Dr. Muller Ramirez in Chile, in a major pharmaceutical manufacturing facility in Chile, and how successful exposure assessment can be done relatively inexpensively in especially limited resource settings. And those settings can also engage in ongoing periodic environmental surveillance to make sure that they identify contamination and that they identify that the strategies they're using are effective at reducing the contamination. Our conclusions were that there already exist extensive data, much of which has been generated by uh, our own center here at the University of Maryland, Baltimore over the years in collaboration with other PAHO collaborating centers in Latin America. Uh, that shows that these uh, exposure assessment strategies are feasible and that the strategies to minimize, to mitigate the exposures are also very feasible to reduce the risk of occupational cancer in health sector workers. Uh, some of these strategies to assess exposure include wipe sampling. So it can be as simple as taking samples from the surfaces in hospitals to see how much chemotherapy drug residue is on those surfaces and then running them through very uh, relatively inexpensive detectors to identify which drugs are contaminating those surfaces. And this is a necessary first step to then implement the hierarchy of controls that we all know about. Uh, obviously, engineering controls that should be our aspiration everywhere, including in limited resource settings, to get engineering controls in place, such as biosafety cabinets, uh, things called closed system transfer devices that prevent exit of the drug from the device itself that uses to administer it. Of course, not every uh, hospital, not every healthcare facility in our region can access those engineering controls, unfortunately. So in the meantime, uh, we do identify administrative and work practice controls, and many of these have been identified in PAHO's 2013 Safe Handling Guidance for Hazardous Drug uh, Exposure. And finally, training workers, training workers in PPE, training workers in these work practice controls. And the most important part after this initial assessment is to keep measuring uh, exposure after you implement these strategies. And we discuss the need for that uh, in our paper. And finally, uh, this just to put it into context of PAHO's broader work on this, the risk of health sector worker exposure to chemotherapy drugs in the workplace uh, it is uh, a prevalent uh, problem in the Americas, and it must continue to be included in PAHO WHO's broader efforts at reducing non-communicable diseases in the Americas, including occupational cancer. Uh, and PAHO and its, and its collaborating centers, including us, uh, should continue to uh, play a leading role in you know, outreach efforts to make sure workers are aware of the risks of cancer-causing drugs in the workplace, that institutional officials are aware, and importantly, national officials are aware of this problem and how surprisingly straightforward it can be to make sure you are aware of the problem and you know how to mitigate the problem, including in limited resource settings. 
And hopefully these efforts will then provide the platform for national policy recommendations to make sure that certain best practices identified by PAHO are implemented in certain countries. And Brazil, Mexico, Chile, these countries all already have national mandates uh, to implement certain safe handling practices for hazardous drugs, including chemotherapy drugs. So this is feasible on a national level. It's feasible on an institutional level, and it can be done very readily in limited resource settings. Thank you. No, thank you, Dr. Amashaj. We appreciate your presentation. And we can relate this presentation with the previous one, again, concerning the exposure and the impact of the environment for health. Of course, this one with a targeted audience on uh, health professionals. So this is a very important uh, topic, especially uh, regarding the um, uh, cancer, because this was one of the leading causes of death and morbidity in the region. So it's very important to uh, work in all types of cancer, including occupational cancer. So the recommendations provided are very uh, practical and can support further work of PAHO with the countries. So thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, to finalize panel four, I pass the floor to Dr. Nancy Van de Vanter from the Rory Mayers College of Nursing of the New York University, United States. Dr. Nancy, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you very much. And uh, hello to everyone. I'm sure this has been a long morning, so I will get right down to talking about our paper. Uh, the title of our, our paper, I guess I don't have that slide. How do I get to that slide? Okay. Uh, is healthy aging and care of the older adult with chronic disease. This is a qualitative needs assessment that we conducted in Eastern and Southern Caribbean islands. Uh, the authors on the paper are myself. I am currently the deputy director of our um, WHO collaborating center. Dr. Madeline Nagel, who is also on this panel, uh, is actually the original director. Uh, she's the founding director of this particular um, WHOCC. Other authors include Nasreen Nizia. She is a senior uh, nursing student who is very interested in the kind of work that the WHOCC does. Dr. Avian Bamadou is a physician and she is I believe certified in the PAHO ICO model. Um, and at the time when we were working on this, she was a physician associated with the Organization of Eastern Caribbean States. Dr. Eileen Sullivan Marks is the, um, dep is the director and the dean of our school. Um, so, and I'm the one who's delivering this this morning. So I have to move on to the next slide. Great. Um, okay, the objectives for this study were to identify health priorities and strategies to strengthen health systems based integrated care for Caribbean older persons. This is consistent with the WHO goal of building interprofessional workforce capacity and also consistent with the PAHO WHO commitment to this decade of healthy aging. Our center is, in fact, uh, a nursing center, so we are a, a, a part of that organization, but our primary content area is geriatrics. Um, so this qualitative needs assessment is informed by the consolidated framework of implement for implementation science, which I believe one of the former uh, presenters also uh, talked about. Implementation science seems to be a very valuable tool for beginning to change things. Uh, this was conducted with islands in the organization of the Eastern Caribbean States, uh, OECS. And we also chose to uh, conduct it with two large, more urban-like Southern islands to be able to get a, a really full picture. Okay, we can move on to the findings. Okay, so the results um, are really extremely helpful for prioritizing the needs of health professionals and the general population. For the aging uh, population, 
there wasn't a lot of uh, services that were directly for these, nor was there much in the way of prevention. In particular, there's a lack of understanding of prevention of NCDs or non-communicable diseases, in particular, obesity and diabetes, hypertension, and heart disease. The development of most NCDs is attributable to lifestyle and diet. So those are things that don't require a, a, a physical um, a meeting with a physician, but they are things that should be assessed and there, are, there should be uh, much more developed programs. Additional priorities that we found including assessment and assessment and services for individuals with dementia, Alzheimer's disease, depression, harmful alcohol abuse. Uh, all of those posed significant challenges for older adults. The needs assessment outcomes are really going to be the foundation of planning the educational interventions. And these will be developed collaboratively by local health providers with the collaboration and support of our College of Nursing, which does have um, a geriatric um, education center that's funded by the Hartford Foundation. Um, also, we think that there's a role for regional WHO CCs and PAHO um, to enhance the use of existing resources. It became clear that there were some things available in some islands, but not known to other islands. So more coordination among the islands, I think is what the take home message was for us. So, um, can we go to the next slide? So how does this act activity support the organization's goals and mandates? This needs assessment supports PAHO and WH goals, goals for the decade of healthy aging. By assessing baseline needs of this Caribbean population that can be used to guide the development of the educational and service programs to enhance the health of an aging population. We found in general that there was a real lack of recognition that people are living a lot longer than they used to. Um, and so the infrastructure for supporting them, was, it just really was not there. And that's our work for the future is to build that. I think, I think that might be my last slide. I think it is, okay. I think it is. Thank you, Thank Dr. You. Nancy. It was a pleasure to hear from you uh, on this topic. As you listen in the beginning, I am the advisor for healthy aging. So uh, we are working very hard on this topic, especially trying to prioritize uh, the issues of the aging population because uh, as Dr. Mentioned, uh, Dr. Nancy mentioned, it is uh, difficult to still recognize that the aging process is so fast and incipient in the region. As integrated care is one of the main areas of action of the Decade of Healthy Aging, which is our main uh, plan of work in PAHO. So the such needs assessment is very important. So we can uh, target interventions for older people and, and explicitly showing their needs, not as an homogeneous group, as it is usually uh, thought about this group. And of course, it can also help to coordinate actions. And uh, as it was highlighted that it was something that it was needed in the Caribbean specifically. And when we revise NCDs for older adults, it's always very important to take a look also in the abilities that older people have, even though they have a chronic condition, because this is the main uh, thing when we uh, think when we think about healthy aging is being able to uh, to maintain functional ability, which is the ability to do the things that they want at older ages and being independent and having quality of life. So thank you very much uh, for your presentation and thank you very much Eliani and uh, Sandy and all the team for having this uh, wonderful uh, webinar put together and of course the. Um, the special wish. Thank you very much. Obrigada. <laughs> Obrigada você, uh, Patricia. Thank you very much for uh, for the moderator and the panelists. So let's move on. Uh, I appreciate for uh, hope the participants who are still here with us. 
we are doing our best to keep up with the time. So without further ado, uh, we are beginning now panel number five, which is related to digital health and infodemics. Uh, our moderator, Mr. Marcelo D'Agostino, who is the senior advisor on information and systems and health uh, here in Pau as well, uh, he's on duty travel. And unfortunately, due to a event that is really running late there, he's not gonna be able to join us today. And he asked me to take over the moderation. So I'm really glad to uh, invite for his intervention, Dr. Francesc Saigui Rubio from the University of Health Sciences from the University uh, of Catalonia, Spain. Dr. Saigui Rubio, thank you very much for being here with us, for your patient, and please, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. And uh, well, uh, it's a pleasure to be here as a full collaborating center in Nihal. Briefly, after uh, more than 15 years of carrying out uh, activities, uh, 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 carrying out training and research activities uh, in, this, uh, in, in the field of telemedicine and promoting digital health in Latin America, collaborating with PAHO. In 2018, we were designated as a full collaborating center in health to support countries that want to develop new telemedicine services, promote the use of e health and study the, the adoption of the mobile health in countries of the region of the Americas and Europe. So this presentation describes some of the activities carried out as a full collaborating, collaborating center in e-health. Uh, our collaborating center provides full support to regional initiatives led by PACO's Department of Evidence and Intelligence for Action in Health, which activities are focused on supporting countries in the region of Americas that want to digitalize their, their services. At the European level, our collaborating center also supports su uh, also supports regional initiatives led by the Data and Digital Health Unit of the Division of Country Health Policies and Systems. This unit uh, seeks to develop new approach and methodologies for the use of new digital technologies in healthcare, such as telemedicine and the use of big data. With the poor declarating the COVID-19, a global pandemic on 11 of March 2020, a significant number of our activities have focused on providing guidance on how to overcome the pandemic through the appropriate use of information and communication technologies. These actions were led by PAHO and include the preparation of dissemination of technical notes, participation in workshops and webinars, and the development of solutions to address COVID-19. Among these solutions, I would like to highlight three. The one that measures the level of maturity of health institutions to implement telemedicine services. The one that assesses the capacity of health institutions to collect critical data for decision making. And the one that aims to assess the safety of mobile health applications. An essential task of any collaborating center is to generate research-based evidence and disseminate knowledge. To promote the use of e-health to reduce social inequalities in health, a common health model based on the use of digital platform was developed in collaboration with PAHO. And finally, the possibilities to develop international telemedicine in Latin America were also studied, and some recommendations for strategy and public policies were proposed to promote its ado adoption. At the European level, uh, we explore the relationship of e-health with robots and artificial intelligence, how digital data supports surveillance strategies in the context of COVID-19 and the requirements for improving routine health information systems for health systems management in the whole European region. I would like to conclude uh, this presentation by stating that social distance with uh, measures imposed as a result of COVID-19 uh, together with the lack of specialists and the size of country are factors that have driven the implementation of a variety of new telemedicine services. However, although health services can be largely provided remotely via telemedicine, this change has not yet fully consolidated. In this context, 
Pak Juan Hu, and together with the collaborative centers, as a Hu collaborative center in health, have an important role to play in its final normalization. Finally, all the actions presented here are useful in understanding the challenges of providing all the evidence and support that Pahuan who needs to formulate strategies for the widespread adoption of telemedicine in any health. Having this disposition, it's important for Colorado centers to help Pahuan who in one or, or in one way or another to influence the decision making at the policy level, both nationally and internationally. Uh, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Dr. Saidi Rubio. Excellent explanation. Uh, let's move to the next uh, panelist for this panel, and then we wrap up with uh, the final comments of this panel. I'd like to invite to the floor Dr. Ian Brooks, who is the head of the WHO Collaborative Center located in the Center for Health Informatics in the School of Information Sciences, University of Illinois, Urbana Campaign, USA. Dr. Brooks, the floor is yours. Thank you very much for being here with us. Thank you, Eliana, and it's, it's good to be here. Uh, so I'm, I'm gonna talk about some work we did over a six month period my slides, can't see. with uh, a large consortium of uh, consultants from AHO, uh, from a number of different organizations, including the Library Reserve Corps. We were set a question uh, in early 2021, how can PAHO help member states respond to the infodemic? That's the flood of information, good and bad, that is accompanying a pandemic or another health event? How can we help people figure out how they should help their population respond? So there are two ways that a member state may want to interact with the center with health misinformation. One is if they know that there is a particular piece of misinformation which is causing a problem within their country. In that case, we provide tools to help them figure out what is the truth behind that. The other, which is the, the main focus of our center, is how do we detect new and emerging threats from the you know, 800 plus million tweets and other social media messages posted every single day? How do we figure out what threat is going to have the biggest effect on public health? How do we figure out what is the evidence or what is the truth behind that threat? And most importantly, how do we recommend that a Ministry of Health or Health Communication team responds to that threat? So we've we divided into uh, three teams. A, detection team focused around uh, data science and using artificial intelligence and uh, big data approaches to sift through this huge amount of data, both in English and Spanish. We intend to eventually uh, extend to Portuguese and other languages to find out what are the new threats. Then we, we work with uh, an AI-driven uh, tool, multi-language, uh, multi-database search engine that will figure out what is the most important two or three papers or websites that a public health official needs to see to know what is behind that particular piece of story? And how do we recommend that they respond? And we look, we are using a storytelling approach to the response. So this was a challenge that we were given. Could we do this? And could we do this within a week? And could we do this with the minimal amount of human intervention? So we set up this 
system. We ran it for, uh, we did a, a trial run for a week. We saw more than 400 new potential threats to public health. For this particular uh, week, we focused on one uh, that was a story that the COVID-19 vaccine contained a molecule called luciferase, which was a satanic marker based on the fact that Lucifer is, is, a, is another name for the devil in the Bible. We decided this was a potentially high level threat. The story we chose to tell to respond to it and recommend that ministries use was not dismissing the fact that it's used the same name, but to tell you the origin of the name of Lucifer, that it means light bearing, that it is a kind of molecule that is used and gives off light. So it's in fact part of nature's miracle because it's underlying you know, fireflies and glow worms and bioluminescence. So to, to turn it around and say, you know, it's a scary name, but it's not a scary uh, molecule. So this was a proof of concept project that took six months. There were, I think, 14 uh, PI authors on the paper. Uh, this was backed by a group of more than 30 students who were kind of playing around with how to detect and how to respond. Uh, I think we, we showed that this was possible to do. Um, we, are, we actually have a proposal pending to develop, turn this into a production resource so that on a weekly basis, we can do this uh, detection, evidence and response cycle and provide to member states recommendations on what is the, the biggest threat we are seeing now and how should they respond. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Uh, Ian Brooks. Uh, once again, uh, we understand the importance of the two papers for everything that we have discussed. And we heard uh, about knowledge gaps, misinformation, infodemics, fake news in a couple of papers, the, the systems, digital health, and uh, is one of the priorities for the region to support countries and of course, uh, to build inside PAHO the capacity to work with new technologies for innovation and to fight uh, uh, fake news and misinformation. So there's a lot of potential for the collaborative work among the collaborative centers uh, on uh, towards this same goal. So thank you very much once again. And without further ado, finally moving for the very last but not least important uh, panel number six, who, uh, which will be addressing the neglected diseases. Uh, I would like to invite Dr. Ruben Santiago Nichols, who is the advisor on oh. neglected infectious disease uh, in PAHO WHO. Thank you very much, Dr. Nichols. The floor is yours. Thank you again for all panelists to stay here with us So until now. Thank you very much, Eliane. Um... Uh, let me introduce, without further delay, Dr. Teresa Giorcos, who is a very good collaborator and friend of PAHO and WHO. He, she is the director of the PAHO WHO Collaborating Center for Research and Training in Parasite Epidemiology and Control, based in the Faculty of Medicine and Health Sciences of McGill University in Canada. So, uh, Teresa, the floor is yours, and thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Santiago. Um, I would like to ask uh, Thank you. Um, so I would like to uh, talk to you about the article on estimating eliminating morbidity caused by neglected tropical diseases um, by 2030. So um, I'm the director of this PAHO WHO Collaborating Center for Research and Training in Parasite Epidemiology and Control. And my co-authors include my colleagues from PAHO, uh, Dr. 
Nichols and Dr. Saboya. And um, the focal point for one of the neglected tropical diseases um, at WHO, Antonio Montresor, uh, my colleague from Peru of long standing, where I've co conducted my research program for over 20 years, Dr. Martin Casapia, and the rest of the co authors are my team in Montreal, Canada. Neglected tropical diseases are, are a cluster of 20 primarily parasitic viral and bacterial diseases that affect about 200 million people in the Americas. So about one in five people in the Americas actually um, suffer from neglected tropical diseases. You will recognize, of course, Chagas disease, Leishmaniasis, uh, soil transmitted helminthiasis as some of these neglected tropical diseases. So the article that will be in the special issue uh, will, will show you some of the activities that this, w, this PAHO WHO Collaborating Center has been involved in. And we've aligned our activities, of course, with the Sustainable Development Goals, where neglected tropical diseases are, ex, uh, ex, are uh, mentioned directly uh, within Sustainable Development Goal 3.3 which is to end the epidemic of neglected tropical diseases. And in that regard, in 2021, the World Health Organization came out with a roadmap for how to achieve eradication, elimination, and control of these 20 neglected tropical diseases. And we have worked uh, with our PAHO colleagues and with WHO colleagues in these three examples um, to achieve this goal. One of them is to finalize the monitoring and evaluation framework for the NTD roadmap where um, guidance is provided pan disease and globally so that every program, every NTD program can understand what the monitoring and evaluation uh, challenges are. And that was published in May of 2021. Secondly, we participated in developing some of the most recent preventive chemotherapy guidelines for control of tania solium taniasis. Um, this is a very important disease, especially in Latin America. And the guidance for this was published in September of 2021. Lastly, we formulated a policy brief for deworming for adolescent girls and women of reproductive age. Up until now, um, deworming guidance has been mostly targeted to school-age children and preschool-age children and so more recently, we are focusing on adolescent girls and women of reproductive age because of the importance of um, these infections, the soil transmitted helminthiasis in adolescent girls and women of reproductive age. So this PAHO WHO Collaborating Center, we continue to participate actively in helping WHO and the Department of Neglected Tropical Diseases with our PAHO uh, partners in making sure and in implementing the guidelines provided in the roadmap so that we can achieve the goals by 2030. One of the things we are doing is participating in what's called the GAT, the GAP assessment tool, which provides a more qualitative assessment within the monitoring and evaluation framework for monitoring progress uh, for the NTDs. We also participate as a member of the Canadian Network for Neglected Tropical Diseases. Many countries now have uh, created their own network for neglected tropical diseases, and we have done that in Canada. And of course, there's the NTD Network for all the uh, non-governmental organizations and Nutrition International, for example. And then there are other centers of excellence that we participate in as well. So how do we support uh, the organization's goals and mandates? We do this by collaborating in activities in which we have an expertise. So expertise specifically in soil transmitted helminthiasis and other parasitic diseases where we can contribute. We want to promote equity in all these activities and more recently with our focus on including adolescent girls and women of reproductive age in um, deworming activities, for example. So we want to combat all the neglected tropical diseases, all 20 of them, so that we can reduce the morbidity and mortality which are attributable to these diseases. And in so doing, we are then improving the quality of life for vulnerable people suffering from neglected tropical diseases in the Americas. Thank you very much for including this manuscript in the special issue. 
Thank you very much, uh, Theresa. I now invite my colleague and friend, Dr. Martha Savoya. Martha works with the AHOS Regional Neglected Infectious Diseases Program. Uh, Martha, please, the floor is yours. Gracias, Santiago, y, y buenas tardes para todos los participantes que aún están con nosotros eh, en esta sesión. Yo voy a presentarles eh, las aproximaciones del artículo publicado en el en el número especial sobre enseñanzas obtenidas en la aplicación de la cero vigilancia integrada de las enfermedades eh, transmisibles en la región de las Américas. Esto es una colaboración entre los centros para la prevención y el control de enfermedades, uno de los centros colaboradores que tenemos allí eh, para una de las enfermedades infecciosas desatendidas que se llama el tracoma. ¿Cómo nos unimos con ellos para expandir esto? No a una sola enfermedad, sino a múltiples y no solo a un país, sino a varios países. En el artículo hacemos una descripción muy detallada de lo que nosotros hemos eh, lanzado en el 2016, que se llama la Iniciativa Multiplex, que es una alianza entre varios países, la Organización Panamericana de la Salud y los CDC, para implementar una herramienta innovadora que complementa los sistemas nacionales de vigilancia epidemiológica de enfermedades, en el cual queremos usar o estamos usando la serología para vigilar en una sola encuesta en una sola muestra de sangre, con un solo ensayo de laboratorio, múltiples enfermedades que son eh, relevantes para una población específica, se incluyen enfermedades tropicales desatendidas, enfermedades prevenibles por vacunación o enfermedades transmitidas por vectores, alimentos o agua. La plataforma única que estamos usando es una plataforma de laboratorio multiplexada que se llama el ensayo de perlas múltiples y dependiendo del equipo que se use se pueden analizar entre 50 hasta 500 analitos diferentes. En el caso de esta iniciativa analizamos anticuerpos IgG para múltiples enfermedades. Eso incrementa la eficiencia del sistema y promueve la integración. Y lo que buscamos son señales serológicas que nos permitan entender un poco mejor en diferentes escenarios cómo se distribuyen las enfermedades, cuál es la carga, cómo se identifican brechas de inmunidad o cómo se hace la vigilancia en los momentos en que un país ha alcanzado la eliminación de alguna de estas enfermedades. En el artículo también se describen los avances en, en tres países que están relacionados directamente con la iniciativa, Brasil, México y Paraguay, eh, que han integrado la cero vigilancia a través de este ejercicio en sus sistemas de vigilancia funcionales. Es decir, esto no es un piloto, no es un proyecto de investigación, es fortalecer los sistemas de vigilancia nacionales, en donde en este primer ejercicio que iniciamos en 2016, hicimos encuestas de corte transversal para responder preguntas que son críticas y necesarias para programas de salud pública, en estas encuestas se han incluido entre 6 a 10 enfermedades diferentes en una sola encuesta en la que tomamos una muestra de sangre seca que se analiza por la plataforma del ensayo de perlas múltiples que fue transferido, la técnica fue transferida de los CDC a los laboratorios nacionales de referencia de los países participantes. Adicionalmente, en ese mismo periodo de tiempo, Dos países adicionales, Guyana y Guatemala, lograron incluir la recolección de muestras de sangre seca en sus encuestas nacionales que eran para una sola enfermedad, para analizar múltiples enfermedades hacia una vigilancia serológica integrada. Actualmente, varios de los países se encuentran finalizando los análisis de resultados de múltiples enfermedades, listos para publicar sus resultados y, lo más importante, para usarlos para tomar mejores decisiones programáticas en el control y eliminación de enfermedades. ¿Qué enseñanzas hemos tenido en esta, en esta iniciativa? Uno, que para fortalecer las capacidades de los países para que usen la vigilancia serológica integrada en sus sistemas funcionales, se necesita, primero que todo, orientaciones y esfuerzos conjuntos, no solamente entre varios países, sino con el apoyo de socios, incluidos los centros colaboradores, como en este caso. Esto requiere tiempo, recursos para catalizar cambios en la forma en que hacemos la vigilancia y es más que transferir una técnica de laboratorio, es transferir el proceso completo eh, que sea útil para la vigilancia, control y eliminación de las enfermedades. Y esto solo se logra a través del compromiso político, el involucramiento técnico y la planificación innovadora. Este centro colaborador que tenemos en el CDC, de los varios que tenemos, este específicamente está ayudándonos a implementar en la región de las Américas la agenda que aprobaron los Estados miembros 
para la eliminación de más de 30 enfermedades infecciosas al 2030 a través de hacer enfoques integrados, estructurados en los sistemas nacionales funcionales y entonces el CDC con este centro colaborador nos está ayudando a que esa cooperación técnica y fortalecimiento de capacidades sea una realidad en las condiciones de los países. Los invitamos a que consulten el, y lean el artículo. Muchas gracias, Santiago. Muchísimas gracias, Marta, y también muchísimas gracias a Teresa por estas dos muy excelentes eh, presentaciones. Yo quisiera destacar algunos aspectos relevantes sobre los dos temas en, eh, o sobre los dos centros colaboradores. En el primer caso, el centro colaborador de, eh, dirigido por la doctora Teresa Giorcos ha eh, generado evidencia a través de investigaciones para evidencia importante que apoya el desarrollo de, de guías y directrices y políticas por parte de la OPS y de la OMS para el control de las geoelmintiasis, por ejemplo. Y también eh, a, a participa activamente en el, en el monitoreo y evaluación de los indicadores que eh, nos van a, a, a permitir evaluar el avance hacia el logro de las metas establecidas tanto en la iniciativa de eliminación de enfermedades de la OPS como en el, eh, la hoja de ruta de las enfermedades tropicales desatendidas 2021-2030 de la Organización Mundial de la Salud. En el segundo caso, quisiera destacar que eh, hay dos, dos cosas eh, principales. Este proyecto ha demostrado que la serovigilancia es una herramienta muy útil para eh, fortalecer aún más los sistemas de vigilancia en salud pública. Y uh, además de eso, también ha mostrado la, la importancia de fortalecer las capacidades para vigilancia en salud pública a través de la serovigilancia integrada, eh, como se ha logrado en estos, eh, en los países que ustedes se los pueden ver en, 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 en el artículo, que son básicamente Brasil, México y Paraguay. Y, eh, y eh, esto es clave porque una de las, de las misiones fundamentales de nosotros como OPS es a apoyar la construcción de capacidad y el fortalecimiento de capacidad en los países para la vigilancia, control y eliminación de las enfermedades infecciosas en general y en particular de las enfermedades infecciosas desatendidas. Muchas gracias. Muchas gracias, uh, doctor Rubén Santiago Nicos, por, por esta excelente intervención. Yo creo que además de esto también sirvió para uh, aterrizarnos y empezarnos el, el, el cierre de nuestro webinar. Les comento que durante este día de hoy, que como muy bien dicho varias veces, fue un día bastante extensivo, eh, de, mucho aprendizaje, de, de mucho aprendizaje, de mucha información, Uh, hemos tenido alrededor de 215 participantes, incluyendo los panelistas y moderadores. Estamos muy felices con el resultado de este webinario. Queríamos agradecer nuevamente la presencia. Yo veo aquí que está todavía el doctor Sebastián García Saizó, nuestro director. Muchas gracias por estar con nosotros hasta ahora y conocer la riqueza de trabajo que, que se fue emprendiendo a lo largo del año pasado. Como muy bien dijo Damián, agradecer a los autores, no solamente de los uh, manuscritos, de los artículos que fueron, eh, eh, que se publican al día de hoy, como también todo el esfuerzo de los demás autores, de los demás centros colaboradores que han sometido sus manuscritos, que han buscado participar de este importante momento uh, de, de, de la organización en dar voz en abrir espacios, en abrir canales de comunicación, de integración, de visibilidad y de, de la certeza que estamos en el camino correcto de trabajar cada vez más con nuestros centros colaboradores, no solo los que están ubicados en la región, como también en otras regiones, en otros continentes. Muchísimas gracias a los que participaron, a nuevamente al equipo que organizó este evento, a Sandra Weinger, Jessica Williams, Nan, el equipo de ITS, los intérpretes, Isabela Varenga, ojalá no esté olvidando a nadie, el equipo de la revista, que están aquí también, que yo veo, Olga Zerpa, Liliana Libstein, 
Sandra Heiger, que subió todos los manuscritos a un tiempo récord también. Entonces, muchísimas gracias porque eh, eh, nuevamente fue un esfuerzo conjunto entre estos dos proyectos que tanto valoramos en la organización. Esperamos muy pronto empezar a organizar el segundo webinario regional de los centros colaboradores, tener más oportunidades de compartir, de dialogar, de encontrar las respuestas o buscar nuevas inquietudes donde los centros colaboradores sigan apoyándonos y haciendo con que las prioridades, los mandatos de la región y a, a nivel global también se, eh, eh, se logren y se alcancen. Muchísimas gracias a todos ustedes y con esto damos por terminado nuestro webinario de lanzamiento de los del número especial de los centros colaboradores en la revista Panamericana de Salud Pública. Muchísimas gracias, feliz día, feliz viernes, buen fin de semana a todos. Muchísimas gracias. Muchas gracias. Chao, chao. Muchas gracias, muchas gracias.